Good morning, and welcome to Storytime. I'm Stephen Human. We are continuing with The Intergalactic Audacity of Becky Blue Shift, my newest middle grade novel. We are on episode four. And uh, as always, the book is available at stephenhuman.com if you would like to have a copy for your children. Um, paperback is always best. You can get an e-copy as well, but let's be honest, paperback is better. Unless you, if you really like Kindle, then knock yourself out. But let's go ahead and continue with episode four, Boring Exposition. Space pirates show up too. Electricity crackled from the glass like a plasma ball and converged on the metal cylinder. The titanium case began breaking apart in tiny bits of ash and debris. A clear tube took shape beneath a dissolving canister, metal slats running from end to end where small computer screens sat, do sat dormant beside colorful buttons and alien symbols. There it is, Edison breathed. I worried it would be damaged, but it looks perfectly operational. What is it? Ben asked while tapping the last tiny piece of mango directly from the ration pack into his mouth. Don't you listen to anything, Becky huffed. She pointed to the floating object in the stasis field. That's the cataclastic projector unit. Ben raised his shoulders to his ears as if to say, your big words are meaningless. It's the most important piece of the puzzle, Edison said, scratching his temple. When Admiral Blitzer first discovered underspace travel almost 900 years ago, he used a mixture of different elements along with the cataclastic projector to open the original space-time breach. Does any of this sound familiar from history class? This is second grade stuff, Ben. I know Admiral Blitzer blew up half Earth's moon during the 50-year war, Ben answered. I know what energy output he used and how many megatons were required. I'd like to try it sometime on an asteroid once mom and dad get back. Becky plopped into one of the research chairs and rubbed her forehead. Of course you'd only pay attention to the explosions. I liked reading Blitzer's war speeches too, Ben said. Don't you care about getting mom and dad home? Becky asked, jumping up from her chair. Don't you care about the Nobels? I want mom and dad back, Ben shouted, suddenly looking like a six-year-old in Becky's eyes. His natural cockiness receded, leaving behind a scared child for the briefest of seconds. Then pay attention next time, Becky ordered. Edison stepped between the siblings and motioned toward the tall stasis field. Ben... With the projector, all we need is to find the second battery unit and the other five elements, and we can reopen the breach to underspace and rescue our parents. But they already opened the breach before, Ben said. That's why they're stuck in there, right? Why can't we just do what they did? Because we need to hold the breach open, Ben, Becky answered, feeling her temperature rise. Her brother's knowledgeable ignorance may have been fine with their dad, since he loved explosions and stupid jokes every bit as much as his son. But in these circumstances, Ben needed to grow up and stop being so childish about everything. When my mom and dad tried to recreate Blitzer's original experiment, they opened the breach to underspace just like our ships do when traveling faster than light. Right, Ben? Edison continued. Yeah, Ben said. They were only using the basic fuel elements from our underspace engines, so the breach was accessible for only an instant, Edison instructed. My dad theorized they could hold it open without Blitzer's original device, but obviously that didn't work, and now they're frozen between dimensions. Blitzer wrote in his journals about the dangers of experimenting with underspace. Yeah, he said crazy stuff about when he held open the first breach and passed through to whatever existed beyond, Becky added. Edison nodded in agreement. That's why our parents wanted to recreate the experiment, and why we have to save them now. Is any of this jogging your memory, Ben? Don't treat me like a baby! Ben said. He jumped from his chair and stormed toward the exit. Then don't act like one next time, Becky called back as he disappeared down the hallway. Silence filled the bridge, except for the humming of computers and the constant engine whirring, or the constant engine vibrations. He's just a nine-year-old kid, Edison said, turning back toward the stasis chamber. Cut him some slack. <laughs> you were just as annoyed as I was, Becky replied. It's like he, he purposely pushes all this out of his mind so he doesn't have to think about mom and dad. He needs to get over it so we don't have to repeat everything ten times. <sighs> what, what's our next stop? Is it that unnamed dope planet just off the shipping routes near Tarsus? Isn't that it? That's where Blitzer wrote he found that rare crystal substance with the glowing properties, right? We don't have enough fuel to make it to that diffident, obscure planetary entity. 
Well, then let's go back to Alpha Centauri to fuel up and, and tell Governor Peppercorn we did it without help from him and the fleet, just like our parents would have done at our age. Maybe now that we've figured out Blitzer's hidden cipher, we can find the other elements and, and he'll finally send an exploratory crew to help us. God, it'll make things easier and mom and dad will be free in no time. We can't get back to Alpha Centauri either, Edison said. His fingers typed at the holographic projector, pulling up a colorful graph indicating fuel reserves. The booster tanks flashed red with an ominous, empty graphic. I had to use the boosters to travel fast enough to save you from the Tungons. I didn't need help with the Tungons, Becky defended, voice rising. Oh yeah, because that big one would have just sat back and let you run away, huh? Oh, I was fine. I didn't need you flying over there. I was doing exactly what what your dad would have done. Edison turned off the graphic and sat back down. Yeah, because my dad always had everything figured out. He he did. I, he does, Becky said, remembering all the times they'd escaped marauders or pirates looking to challenge the great Nitro Nobel. Then why are we having to fly around the galaxy trying to save him? Edison yelled. <laughs> I know he wanted me to be more like him, but look at what being him has gotten everybody. Well, he, he didn't want you to be like him, Becky said. Just because I was always more like your mom and dad doesn't mean... I don't want to talk about any of this right now, okay? Edison interrupted. We have enough to worry about without getting mad at each other. We don't have enough fuel to enter underspace, so we can jump back to the fleet. I don't even know if we'll have enough gas to get to a fueling outpost. And even if we did, they're not going to accept Centauri fleet credits this far out. Ah, oh, why did I listen to you? We, we should have just stayed with Governor Peppercorn and let his team handle the rescue. They weren't even planning a rescue, Edison, Becky countered. The regents think it's hopeless. Your mom and dad wouldn't have, wouldn't have sat back and done nothing. They trained us for this. You studied how to be a pilot under my mom, and she's the best aviator out there. And I learned everything from your mom and dad, everything they ever taught me. Nobody else is brave enough to even try to rescue them. So we have to do it. Well, what do we do now, huh? Edison asked. What do we do, Becky, with no gas? Throw our bravery at the problem? <sighs> we lost our landing module, and I'm assuming your space helmet too, and now this? We're gonna have to call Peppercorn for help. We're not calling Governor Peppercorn until we have the next element, Becky said, stepping closer to Edison. You said so yourself. He'll shut us down if we ask for help at this point. He'll say we're just kids, like he did before we left. We're not calling Peppercorn until we can't think of anything else. We already have the projector, Edison argued, voice rising. <sighs> Excuse me. Sometimes when you're reading a, a, a book, like when I have my, my audio books, um, burps just kind of appear. So I'm trying to hold them back. But when you're just talking and breathing, sometimes that happens. Just something that you probably don't know because <laughs> you probably never recorded an audio book. <laughs> but there you go. That was, a, that was an escaping burp. Okay, back to the story. Sorry about that. Okay. We already have the projector, Edison argued, voice rising. That should be enough to prove we were right all along. We have nothing to gain by going directly to the next element. It would be reckless. I'm not reckless, Becky yelled. I'm just doing what your dad would have done. Edison stood, face pointing to the ceiling as if asking heaven for help. What ideas do you have then, Becky? Seriously, what great plan do you have to get us fuel? My dad's not coming to help us. Becky opened her mouth to answer, not really knowing what to say beyond, you're stupid and I'll figure it out, when red lights began flashing throughout the bridge. A pulsing alarm followed. Alert, alert, Ada's computer voice tweeted with deceptive positivity. Ships converging on the y-axis from the direction of the Solaris outpost. Designations unknown. I don't see them out the window, Becky said, looking to the stars beyond the glass panes. Edison ran over to the computers and typed furiously. That's because they're beneath us on the Z-axis. Uh, let me pull it up on the holosphere. A three-dimensional image formed in the center of the bridge, showing the Loveless along with three other ships approaching from below. Each ship painted black to make them harder to see against the dark space sported six lateral engines that came together in a point on the aft. Their front ends featured spikes of metal jutting in all directions, along with barbaric harpoon guns that could snare approaching ships and cable them in inescapable traps. 
Becky recognized the red symbol painted on the holes of the ragtag squadron, the demonic skull face of Queen Alalababa Yagal adorned each vessel. Try saying that three times fast. Alert, alert, Ada warned. My communication protocols are being... The holosphere image flickered and disappeared, replaced with the enormous 3D head of a man with purple skin, cybernetic left eye, and an abnormally long nose. A large, pointed black hat covered his head with a pink feather sprouting from the top. Captain Nostrellus, Becky spat. Ah, Blue Shaft, Nostrellus bellowed in his high, nasally voice. How are mom and dad? And that blasted... Oh, that's right. He's supposed to have a British accent. Let me do that again. He's supposed to be British. Ah, Blue Shaft, Nostrellus bellowed in his high, nasal voice. How are mom and dad? And that blasted Nitro doing in their interdimensional prison. My dad will shove his fist up your nose, Edison shouted while swiping his hand through the hologram as if slapping Nostrellus. The loveless suddenly rocked to the side as if hit by something. Becky grabbed the closest chair to keep herself on her feet. What do you want? Becky asked. You, you better not try to tether this ship. We're here for whatever you dug up on, ling on Lingua, Nostrellus said with a crooked smile. Everybody knows the legends about Blitzer. Our long-range scanners picked up the heavy burn from your engines. You were moving fast, which means I think you got what you came for and we're making a run for it. We know what you're after and how much it'll be worth. Hand it over and we'll, you'll, or you'll join your parents in whatever space death they've discovered. You can't take it, Becky said with a defiant jab of the finger. You'll have to rip it out of my dead hands first. <laughs> I'm fine with that, Nostrellus continued. Get ready to be boarded and executed. What's going to happen? Well, you're going to have to find out in Episode 5, Cyborg Pirates and Stinky Feet. So, there you go. That was Episode 4. Again, if you want to get the book for yourself, it's on stephenhuman.com in both digital and paperback. I can send you signed copies if you want. That's a thing I do. Um, we will continue tomorrow with story time. So, until then, have a great day.